<laughs> Welcome. Welcome to our general meeting. Uh, my name is Walid Kogali Ali, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Bold Coalition. Uh, I want to uh, welcome also, welcome you all to our meeting, but um, quickly talk about the Bold Coalition. But before I do, uh, I want to quickly uh, ask my fellow co-chair, Liz Driver, to introduce herself, and then we're going to get started. We're talking about our goals and get into this very important discussion uh, related to community benefits across the Ontario line uh, and the federal requirements for those community benefits. Liz? Thanks, Waleed. So my name is Liz Driver. I'm the director of Campbell House Museum. Guess where that is? Right beside Osgood Station. So as a museum, we care deeply about our community and our public realm, and we're always looking to improve it, not damage it. And so for two years, I've been very involved in the public process for the Ontario line with respect to Osgood. But when, after multiple uh, legal actions, community demos, and so on, uh, Metrolinx moved in to cut our trees, I saw that the trees at Moss Park were being cut down on the very same day. And that made me look beyond Osgood Station to what was happening all the way along the line. And hence we have the Bold Coalition Build Ontario Line Differently uh, created at the beginning of this year. And there have been many wonderful developments since then. Together with the politi- our councillors, for Toronto and East York. Um, We've come together on a common cause. A subcommittee on Metrolinx's Ontario Line construction has been formed. There are staff reports um, in process. Information has been gathered. Many motions um, put forward by the subcommittee were unanimously adopted by City Council on May 10th. But what are the goals of BOLD? Um, so excuse me while I consult my paper so I don't forget anything. I should say first that um, BOLD obviously supports new t- public transit. It's going to help all of us, including my museum. But it must be done responsibly, transparently, and in cons- consultation with Torontonians. The Ontario line is a a big project, it's a big scale, and it has big impacts. I'm not going to go into all of those impacts right now. Um, They are reflected in our our goals, but, you know, the original budget was $10.9 billion. It's already been exceeded, and it's projected to be close to $20 billion at this point. And the province itself is responsible for any cost overruns. Now, let's, let's just go right to the goals. So, in the first instance, we want to build a broad awareness about the scope of the Ontario line, its construction plans, and its many impacts. During construction, the health and safety of communities is key. We want to protect our green spaces, trees, and heritage sites from construction impacts. We want to build awareness at both Queen's Park and City Hall that transit is city building, which requires authentic, honest consultation. We want to support residents' associations and our elected representatives in requiring Metrolinx to be accountable and transparent as it builds back better. And part of that, we hope will be the requirements that the federal government has placed on this provincial agency. We want to ensure that Metrolinx consults meaningfully with impacted communities. Um, And so we're looking for community-forward solutions and shared learning as we navigate these issues. And every time we face a problem, lack of response from Metrolinx, we can turn to each other and with, to our groups and find a way forward. And this has, is already happening. 
So um, it has been absolutely wonderful to meet people um, and share information about what's been happening all the way along the line. And very important for tonight's meeting is we want to ensure that the federal funding requirements are respected. We want to advocate for substantial affordable rental housing across the new transit-oriented communities, robust community benefits, and youth employment opportunities. So I think that these are goals that probably everybody in the city could support um, because it will make, if, if we can do this and hold Metrolinx accountable, it will make a better city for all of us. Thank you, Walid. Well said, Liz. Thank you so much. So those are our goals. Aren't they amazing goals? Uh, and, and these goals require transparency and accountability, uh, specifically when it comes to developments that are going to impact our communities. And, uh, you know, while we were talking to the media, we were talking to CP24 earlier, uh, one of the things that Liz Driver uh, my fellow co-chair hammered home was the importance of the mayoral elections, right? Uh, they're soon approaching, and what we're hoping to do is through our survey, which we sent out to all the mayoral candidates, we want to get a commitment from the mayoral candidates and our new mayor that they're going to work with communities to make sure that the investments made uh, are responsible and not that residents are in, uh, are watching what's going on, but they're actually part of the development of the great ideas that need to be implemented, right? Uh, and we, we want to thank all the neighborhood associations that have joined us online and in person. Uh, and, you know, before we talk about the, uh, the mayoral, uh, the engagement when it comes to the mayoral elections, uh, we want to invite our special guest to talk about those specific uh, special uh, requirements that we want everyone to be aware of, the federal requirements. Uh, so I know folks online, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, we're going to invite our member of parliament, Julie Debrusen, I hope I said your last name properly, uh, who is responsible uh, for uh, making sure that uh, those federal requirements are implemented across the Ontario line, and they can, uh, hopefully can get more information. And we're going to do a Q&A right after this because I know our MP has to be somewhere else. Uh, so we'll quickly get into that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Julie DeBruce, and I'm the Member of Parliament for Toronto Danforth. Um, so the Ontario line is going to have a substantial impact through my community. Um, as it crosses as well through other parts of the city. But so that's why I had a particular interest in, in exactly the parts that were raised actually when we were talking about goals, about how do we make sure that communities are involved? How do we make sure that the process is transparent? You know, let's be clear, transit is in this case provincial and municipal. So the federal government really doesn't have any say in how it gets designed. We don't design uh, transit, we don't do all of those pieces. But for the first time ever, and it wasn't just funding for the Ontario line, it was funding for the province as a whole when it came to transit funding, there were certain conditions that were attached to this funding. And that was just to make sure that when we're, we're putting this money into our cities, that, that it reflects a lot of what we're hearing from people about what they want to see. So um, I'm just going to check notes on a little bit to make sure I have it through. But the main ones that you raised were affordable housing and community benefits. Those are central ones for sure. But there are also ones about, you know, local concerns. And, and that's an important piece as well. So, and, and I think that that's one that you can hold to as far as how do we make sure that in all of our conversations, we're, we're making sure neighborhood associations like all of you are, are able to coordinate with your communities and then have your voices heard as you go forward. So that's a bit of kind of the high-level background to it um, and what the conditions look like. Um, all that to say, ultimately, um, you know, the federal government has taken this new kind of position of having conditions as part of the agreement. Uh, but the day-to-day -day conversations are really through the province and the city, so I'm kind of excited that you're continuing to that conversation as well. So um, why don't I, because I unfortunately have to leave in 10 minutes, um, so I wanted to make sure if there were some questions that we would also have time for that. 
Um, but I can tell you that, that, you know, we stand by the conditions, uh, there, we don't just say them. Um, and w- the goal is to give kind of the tools for communities and for all of us to work cooperatively as we can to try and get to some good solutions on this, uh, on public transit. Because I- I've said it before, I don't own a car, right? So I use public transit to get around. I cycle, I cycled today, I walk. It's important that we get all of this right to make sure that people can get around our city and it'll benefit all our communities if done right. So um, maybe if I can pass it to you, if you had some questions. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. So what we're going to do is we're going to take questions uh, from the audience. But before we do that, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pose some questions as well uh, on behalf of Bold. Uh, so the first question is, um, and this is some context for many folks who might not know this, but... Residents have been knocking, basically knocking on the door and saying, we want not to be just told what's happening in our neighborhood. We want to be involved in whatever uh, discussions are going to impact our community. And there was something called a community liaison committee. Uh, and the community liaison committee was a space for residents to engage with members of Metrolinx. Uh, we haven't had conversations with Inf- Infrastructure Ontario as of yet. Uh, and, and maybe the first question could be, is, um, uh, let me finish this contact first and then this question, is how could residents be more engaged in having conversations with Metrolinks and Infrastructure Ontario to ensure that they're held accountable to those requirements, but most importantly develop a work relationship with the residents to co-develop, co-create what those local solutions should look like. Uh, so that's the first question. Uh, so we just some context. There's a community liaison committee, but there's also one that's focused on community construction, right? So updates, you know, what's happening with regards to, uh, you know, the uh, road closures or, or other important pieces that people should be aware of, okay? So that's the first question. Um, so thank you for that question, because I guess it goes to the heart, really, of what we're talking about. How can we make sure voices are heard from people across the community? And I saw it in my own community. And look, you know, being able to have a community liaison, being able to have your voices heard, doesn't mean that everybody's going to get exactly what they want, and everybody understands that, right? But it does mean that you can see the dial move, um, and that you can see that your, you know, your concerns were heard, and, and you can see a proper full response to that, right? Like that's what I consider a proper consultation because not everyone in the room is even going to necessarily agree on exactly what the solutions are that they want. In, in my own community, I did see um, a liaison group that was formed that was able to have an impact on, on some of the design. It wasn't easy. I'm not going to even begin to pretend that it was an easy process. But ultimately, they were able to... To, to move the dial, as I've said, and, and to have see some changes made and to have their voices heard as to how parts of it would be designed. So I think that the first part and, and is to make sure to reach out to Metrolinks with a clear group. It sounds like you have a liaison group set up. They can set you their exact policies because I don't know Metrolinks that well, but, but to make sure that you are kind of hammering home, for lack of a better way, like, Hammering home sounds not very nice, but, but, you know, articulate for sure what, what your community concerns are and then also put forward what the realm of the possibilities are for what you would like to see, right? You know, I think that that, that helps. Um, and now the part about where, where I come in, because as far as Metrolink's responsiveness, that's, that's on them in the province. My job is to say, hey, we have these conditions. And we want to make sure that we're seeing that this interaction is happening and that it's working well. So I'm not here to defend Metrolinx. I want to be very clear. Not my corporation. It's provincial um, and how they do it. My job is as a federal partial funder towards this project is to make sure that when we attach these conditions that we're taking them seriously and that we want to make sure that we're seeing community voices that are being heard and respected if I could say, like in the two words. So that that's just a piece that I would say is, is to make sure, though, I, I think that I've seen solutions. I've seen community work towards solutions, not in all cases, though, by the way, but, like, I see progress. So I, I see some hope when I see this room with people who are ready to do that hard work. 
well said. I know Liz is going to ask the next question, but to incentivize all of you to, and I know I see some hands up, we've got some raffle prizes to give away. Okay, so for those that ask those important questions, we will be considering that. Uh, so before we move on to Liz, I just want to give a shout out to the Moss Park Coalition and the Bold Coalition uh, for actually getting Metrolinks to commit to meeting with them regularly, right? Uh, you know, uh, monthly for the Moss Park uh, Coalition, uh, Bold uh, even more, uh, hopefully as regularly throughout the year. And those meetings are important. But what we also need to think about is how do we build capacity in residents so they could get more involved, right? Uh, think about your neighborhood association. Think about the information that you that you have access to. And we have our friends from Toronto Community Benefits Network here. So David is back here. He's uh, one of the folks from TCBN. Um, I know Kumse is also here as well. Uh, and we also have, you know, elected, uh, our elected representatives, their staff are here, right? So for Marcian, I just want to give a shout out. We have Nemo, my good friend. What's your name? Saba, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that our elected representatives are at the table and are as engaged as well because they need to hear from residents directly about their concerns, right? So we're going to now take the next question from Liz. So um, I understand that, um, first, first of all, it's very hard uh, for us all to understand the connection between Metrolinks and Infrastructure Ontario. And we understand that it's Infrastructure Ontario that will be building the transit-oriented communities, which will include the affordable housing, hopefully. It, there don't appear to be targets. And how will, how will the federal government uh, monitor the situation to make sure that, that whatever comes out of this is sufficient in terms of um, how, how how this is quantified. Thank you. So that's a good question because affordable housing is critical for our city. Um, so within the terms, there are pieces about affordable housing. I can't answer the question about Infrastructure Ontario versus Metrolinx and how that's organized because that's what the province does. But as far as within the terms of the conditions, there will be, you know, Criteria that's, they're actually being still negotiated as far as it goes, but that's, that it will be worked in there. So there will be, be targets and the like in there. But again, on the infrastructure Ontario Metrolinks piece, I'll have to, I apologize, leave that, <laughs> leave that to a provincial person to explain exactly how to work through those. Okay, next question. So, we have a friend here. Hi. Sure. I'm Rosemary Waterston. I'm here from the Community Advisory Committee for the Lakeshore East. And Julie and I have met many times over these conditions. And so I just wanted to ask for a little bit of an update. When we talked last in July, um, you were waiting for the Federal Parliamentary Secretary of Intergovernmental Affairs to work with the Ontario Transportation Minister to come up with the actual project contribution agreement. And I presume that's what is going to give the details on affordable housing and the other parts of the um, uh, of the conditions. So can you give an update? I mean, it's 40% of the funding comes from the federal government. So you have a big hand to play on this. And we really need you to uh, hold the feet to the fire for Metrolinx and the Ontario government. So thanks, Julie. Yeah. No, thank you. And actually, you, your organization is part of the organization I was talking about where when we saw some talk about sound protection walls and sound barrier walls, there were some changes made as a result of it. Um, so I'm not sure about the exact quote on that as far as who's negotiating it, but it's the matter of any agreement made with the province has to go through Treasury Board as far as the funding, and so those terms are still being negotiated. That's not unusual as far as timelines. It's just as big agreement that has to be worked through. So so there is still negotiations. I did touch base recently to get a sense of where they were at, and I was assured that they're making progress and setting up what the exact pieces are. But the thing is the general terms are known. So, for example, which, which you all know, and so those are public and out there. What we're doing is hammering out the exact details of the wording as to how that looks, and, and that's... I, that my latest update was that they were still working through all of those and going through it, but that they have conversations regularly still to say, you know, that there's a community benefits 
term to this agreement, you know there's an affordable housing piece. It's not that the conversation stopped happening. Um, it's just that they're still, still nailing down the exact details. On the other hand, I'll also point out the funding doesn't flow until that point, right? So it's not that there has been any funding that's been provided to date uh, as they still go through the negotiated agreement. Community members are not involved in negotiating the contract between the federal government and the provincial government, nor are they really ever. It's, it's, it's terms of agreement between two orders of government. Um, as far as how that looks on the ground, part of it is that you're supposed to have community engagement as part of those conditions, right? Like, so one of the conditions is community engagement. But but in the actual negotiation of an agreement between the province and the federal government, there isn't community engagement. Thank you for that. Next question. The, these conditions, are they public? Uh, where can you see the conditions that uh, the federal government is uh, imposing on the provincial government and uh, how often are they updated? As you say, the things are still in negotiation. So uh, what's the access point? The conditions were actually in the news release when the, when the agreement was signed. So th those have been out there since the very beginning as far as you know, the, the continued negotiations. Those are still happening. But the actual, I mean, I can read you as a part of the news release if you wanted, just for clarity. But it is satisfying conditions, including demonstrating how the investments will drive down emissions and build resilience, substantive environmental reviews, ensuring affordable housing along the line, incorporating accessibility, mitigating local concerns, maximizing benefits for communities, including through community benefit agreements, and meeting employment thresholds for underrepresented communities, including black, indigenous, and people of color, and women. So th those were in the news release um, as the terms and the conditions at the time. Excellent. We have a question online. Uh, Shelly, do you mind unmuting yourself? Uh, the MP can see you right here and you're online. And go ahead, ask your question. Um, I know you have to go. Uh, I just want to build on what Rosemary was saying. Um, we are currently trying to standardize the CLC uh, process with Metrolinx. And we are building in... Um, a clause which says that Metrolinx must help facilitate a, the um, community benefits agreements uh, with the province and the federal, uh, following the federal government's federal funding conditions. So we're trying to base this into the beginning of the process. You know, the joint corridor is very early construction right now, so we're about to start. Um, I guess my question is, like, when are they coming? What is the status of negotiations? Like, how do we get more of a line of sight on, um, you know, how they're going to implement and what these specifics are? Um, I guess we're just boots on the ground right now in a game trying to ensure that these things are going to be happening for all of our communities from the get-go. Thanks. No, thank you. Um, and actually, you know, well, you and, and Rosemary have been really at the front line of this whole conversation for quite a while now. So um, thanks for being here for today. And as far as the, you have right there in the terms that I just set out for you, actually the, the bones to what those conditions are, which they set out clear, they set out clear intentions already. And, and the issue is making sure that they are, they land on the ground. And I think that the part about how people in communities organize to be effective is a really important part of that. Um, because it's, it's a tool, but then we also have to make sure that people know that the tool is there and, and that they know how that they can access them. Um, the exact terms will will be coming as they negotiate them. And I do not know the exact state of the negotiations between the province and federal government at this moment. But the thing is, you already have within those conditions that there must be community benefits, that you that you know the, the employment of underrepresented groups. You have the part about requiring affordable housing, which is going to be 
steps away still, like in the process, I'm, I'm guessing because they have to build the line first. But, um, so you have, you have the bones of what the intentions are, including the part about engaging community. Um, and that's a bit of a hard one to define in many ways, to be honest. What that looks like might even look different in different communities. But the important part is that it's, I see it as baked in. The community has to be part of the solution. Excellent. We have one very important question from our friends at Toronto Community Benefits Network. So, Mr. Kumsa Baker. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kumsa. I'm from the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with Metrolinx, uh, both on Eglinton and Finch, to negotiate community benefit agreement. Um, yesterday, uh, yesterday, actually, me and my colleague, David, we actually went through the project agreements for both the contracts and the Ontario line. And uh, from our perspective, none, nothing in the project agreements currently have anything that speaks to community benefits agreements. Um, uh, when we look at community benefit agreements as something that's very specific, to the project, uh, has targets, it's measurable, uh, and it, and it's transparent. Uh, and it doesn't check any of those boxes, uh, and that's unfortunate. Um, and so I think there, there really needs to be a conversation specifically, uh, with the federal government in terms of how were they able to, um, remove themselves from those targets that were in the conditions. Uh, you mentioned the 10%, uh, you know, focus on, uh, black, indigenous, racialized communities. Uh, all along the line, most of these neighborhoods are highly racialized. Um, and so I think this is a really significant missed opportunity. Uh, right now, both consortiums are hiring as we speak uh, for many professional administrative technical opportunities that people in these communities could have access to. Uh, and so this is a, a really urgent issue. I think that the federal government needs to put a lot more uh, involvement and working with the community to figure out how could we put pressure on Metrolinx, on the province, to deliver on what was promised? Thank you. One hundred percent. Thanks for flagging that. I I will like, and actually, I should have a conversation with you afterwards to take a better look at that. One hundred percent. It's it's clear there have to be community benefits. Like it's it's right there in the conditions, and there is specifically said that there has to be hiring for underrepresented groups. That's that's in the conditions. But I'll take a look. I'll also say like yes, we have the conditions, but these are also responsibilities of you know the provincial agency to to get right. So I, I'm just going to put it that way that yes, like we have them in the conditions, but they're also there um, for for Metrolinks to get right. But either way, like. Um, what I'll do, because I do have to go in a couple minutes, but I will grab your information to make sure I can follow up on that because it, it's clearly stated. I just read to you. It was from a press release. I just read to you exactly what it says, and it's pretty clearly stated right there. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, last question. Last question. Diane. Okay, go ahead. Hi. I'm <clears throat> Diane DeVenue from the Moss Park Coalition, and when we're talking about community engagement, so far, we have seen a massive fail, um, both with respect to Osgood, with sincere efforts to present a, a plan that's being consistently ignored, and with respect to a lack of engagement at all with planning decisions, with designs, anything in the community. We were just told. And when we tried to stand up, um, it was too late. And so already... Um, they they have failed in that um, requirement. So how how do how do we move forward? And how and it's for some things it's not too late to turn things around, particularly at Osgood. Um, how how do we move forward with that? And and how can the federal requirement um, apply the pressure to to make sure that that happens? Thank you. Um... I would say let, first of all, let your local member of parliament know. I think that's, a, and I mean it truly, like it's a critical piece and it is the kind of thing that like I have consistently throughout the whole, whole part of, you know, seeing Ontario line in my own community have always, when community reaches out about things, forwarded along to Metrolinks and been like, hey, what's going on? And I don't usually actually have a conversation with Metrolinks because they're not a federal agency. So it's not, it's not a usual kind of conversation that I would have, but suddenly because of the conditions, I can say, Hey, 
you know, this is what the community is saying. So my first part would be to reach out to your local member of parliament just to let them know so that they can forward it ahead and just be aware of what's happening. Um, and I, it's unfortunate what you're saying about the first part, but the second part about you seeing still a place for community voices to play, I'd say, um, you know, trying to work through whatever community liaison they can set up. But, but I think that we have to make sure that for the part that can still be saved going forward, that, that you do have a seat at the table. So from the federal side, the best I can say is your local MP just to alert that there's an issue. And then I think you have to make sure that Metrolinx hears you. By the way, there is an office for Metrolinx uh, on Queen Street East. Um, I'm just saying, like, again, I see some people, like, you know, shaking their heads. I don't represent Metrolinx. Let me be clear. I do not represent Metrolinx, and they're not a federal agency. I'm just telling you what's out there. My federal role is that there are conditions, because we wanted to make sure that we stood by communities and what people said they wanted, right, and what we were hearing. That's that's what we did. And it's a big step to have federal conditions. We We don't usually have federal conditions like this applied. So it's a good news story in the fact that we have something that we can turn to and look to, but we also need to make sure that people are reaching out directly to Metrolinx so that they are hearing and, and their MPPs as well, I would say. Well said. Thank you. Liz, you want to say one last thing? I want you to know that Metrolinx has promised us a community liaison committee for 10 months and has not provided the forum. And we also do not have an we also do not have a an active MP in our area for reasons. Um, okay. Well, you know what? Um, thanks for flagging that piece about the the ten month delay. And um, you know, I'll, I'll take I'll take that back as feedback from this meeting. That's part of the reason I came out to this meeting was also to get some of the feedback. And I think I've gotten a few pieces right now so far of from actually different parts of the line, to be quite frank. Um, that's why I came, right? I came because every time I hear about it, it at least gives me a chance to raise a flag. And I think that we need to keep doing that because this is a huge project for our city. It has economic opportunities, like with jobs. It also has opportunities for transit, which we all know we need. But, you know, we need to be sure that as it's getting built, and community members are, are having a say and being able to, you know, make sure that, it, it, they end up with the best results for their communities. And each community knows their own community best. So I, I think that's really important. So thank you for flagging that, and, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I just want to thank our member of parliament, um, who is uh, not just representing uh, the Danforth, uh, Toronto Danforth, but uh, is also the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources, and to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And I know climate change is a part of this conversation as well, uh, especially when you're building transit. So thank you so much for being here, for listening to all of us, uh, special representatives of the various neighborhood associations and the folks online. And we hope to send this message out through the public, through the news coverage today, that it is critical that... Metrolinx and any other provincial agency be transparent about the roles that residents can play in making sure that community benefits are delivered across the Ontario line, but most importantly, what are those forms? How could they get more engaged? So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please follow our social media platforms. And for more information, please visit our website.